Hello White Bikes, welcome back to my channel. Hey everybody, happy Tuesday. Hope your week is going well so far. Got a cheeky wee purple light on today because it makes my hair look less yellow. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, I said in my last video that coming at a later date would be a certain video about a certain lady called Gertrude Bell. And today, that video shall be. This was part of work for my presentation that I did uh, just before my birthday. Uh, if you watched my birthday video, I said that my presentation was poggers. This is that presentation, just in a video format. And I'm not just reusing my work. I do genuinely have an interest in Gertrude Bell and her life and her legacy and stuff. My presentation centred around Gertrude Bell and her archaeological legacy, specifically her Byzantine Turkish archaeological legacy. The girl's very accomplished, right? So that's what we're doing today. We're having a little chat about Gertrude Bell and her Byzantine legacy. Well, let's go! So you're probably thinking, Ree, who is Gertrude Bell? Who's this woman that you keep talking about? Gertrude Margaret Lothian Bell lived from 1868 to 1926. She was an adventurer, an archaeologist, a politician, a writer and a spy. And she was born to a wealthy family who lived in County Durham. She received a first class pass in history at Oxford University, which is the equivalent of like a modern day degree, but obviously a degree in history doesn't give you any like archaeological training, um, so she kind of done that on her own and learned from people in the field. She absolutely loved Arabic culture, language, archaeology, history and all that, so much so that she was recruited by British intelligence for World War One. So that's how she became a spy. And then because of that she became very very important in Iraqi politics at the time. But unfortunately for her, trigger warning. She died of a possible accidental overdose on sleeping pills in 1926 at the age of 58. Her successor at the Baghdad Museum describes her as a woman in a man's world. So I've not written this quote down, I can't remember it for the life of me. A woman in a man's world, yet she was more important than all of them. I think the quote is. All my sources will be down there by the way, so you can go and check that if I'm wrong. I'm going to give you a wee overview about the important stuff that she did not directly related to Byzantine archaeology just because it gives you an idea of exactly how important this woman was because she was a big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. So she gained power in Iraqi politics during her work as a British intelligence officer during World War One and after World War One had already finished and she became honorary dictator of antiquities in Iraq. She established the Iraq Museum in Baghdad which she herself described as she wanted it to be sort of like the British Museum but a bit smaller. She also helped to establish Iraq's first monarch, eh, Faisal the First. You look this way. Hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> she was crying again, and now she's like, "Don't want to be here. Don't want to be here." She helped to establish Iraq's first monarch, Faisal the First. That was in 1921, and then she also helped to establish Iraq's national boundaries and territories. And over time, she developed a motive to safeguard the archaeology of Iraq. Most, if not all, of her excursions to the east were funded by her dad because he was a very, very wealthy man. So she wasn't constricted by the ideas and like agendas of a lot of archaeological sponsors because that's often what happens. She had pretty much free reign because her dad was funding her and he didn't really care. He just let her go, do her own thing. And she kept him well up to date with what she was finding and her progress in that uh, through letters which are evidenced in her archive. This isn't specifically her work. Uh, but there's a film out called Queen of the Desert but it stars Nicole Kidman as Gertrude. Uh, it's about her life and her work and a possible love interest that she had uh, who was a married man but she had later correspondence with him and it seems like they really loved each other and then he went off to world war one and died gertrude never married by the way she never had kids but she did well as a woman on her own in a man's world so she didn't need to so what is this archive i keep going on about the gertrude bell archive is what it's called it's available through the newcastle university website if you just type in gertrude bell newcastle you will find it. This is a huge part of her legacy. It's an archive of all of her photos that she took, all of her letters, correspondence, notes, drawings, plans, all of that stuff. And then in 1926, just after her death, her sister, I believe, gave it to the Newcastle University. And these photos, oh my god, these photos, some of them are absolutely incredible. They are so, so important to our archaeological record and I'm going to tell you for why. Around 8,000 of them are actually online. You can go and look at them. I've trudged through a few for this work. Oh my god, there are so many. But they're good. 
They're good photos and they're really interesting to look at. They were all taken and collected pre-World War One. What does that actually mean in terms of archaeological significance? Well, Gertrude travelled to all of these places in the East before World War One. She came home, World War One commenced. After World War One and in many conflicts subsequently after, a lot of the sites that she photographed were either heavily damaged, completely destroyed, or they are now in no-go war zone unsafe areas. No one's been able to get to see them or see them in their full glory since Gertrude photographed them. So these photos are extremely useful for us today to understand these sites that we can no longer get to, or for some of them we can maybe get there, but there's nothing left. I've got nothing left! For the ones that are still being damaged today, the more damaged these sites become, the more important Gertrude's photos become over time, because hers is the only surviving record that we have of it. And the majority of photos that I show you today of certain sites and that, and of Gertrude herself, she took a couple selfies. The majority of the photos that I'm going to show you are going to be from the Gertrude Bell archive. Now I want to look at her specifically Byzantine work. Obviously not all of it, but the main bits. So over a period of 15 years, Gertrude took five journeys looking specifically at late Roman and Byzantine antique archaeology. And she was among the first people to excavate on the Anatolian Plateau in Turkey, which commenced in 1907. This was when she excavated the site of Bin Berkelis with William Ramsey, which they did so under the protection of the Grand Vizier of Constantinople himself. Obviously at that time it was dangerous for anybody to go travelling, especially for a woman, it was very very dangerous. So wherever Gertrude went, she ensured to get the highest administrative power on her side as an ally to provide protection or just give their blessing for her to be in the area so that she wouldn't be attacked. Gertrude mainly focused on the architectural remains, so the big building bits, whereas Ramsay was more focused on the inscription remains and like reliefs and stuff, which meant that small finds, for the most part, were neglected completely. I've got ring light fever in my eyes, I can't even see my notes on the paper because I can just see ring light. For example, a bunch of Mycenaean pottery shards were found atop a mountain at the site of Mahalich, which I will be going into much more detail in a couple minutes. You know me, I love Mycenae, right? As soon as I read that there was Mycenaean pottery shards on this site, I was like, oh, I need to find out more about that. But alas, the pottery shards were lost in transit by Ramsay's men and no one seemed to care. Like they were shipped off to go somewhere to be examined further by someone who actually cares about pottery, but they were lost. Gertrude and William really weren't that bothered that they were lost because neither of them took an interest in it. But regardless, Ramsay and Bell published the results of their excavation of Ben Berkeley's in 1909 in the work titled A Thousand and One Churches. This is still an incredibly useful document today. It is the results of their excavations on the Karadag mountain peaks in Turkey from May to June of 1907. And the book separated into two sections. You got Gertrude's architectural bit and then Ramsay's inscriptions bit. But it's not like two books published in one, they do actually consult each other on analysis and stuff, so it's kind of intertwined, but the two main sections are kind of split. It's been expected that structures existed on the Karadag Peaks for at least 3,000 years. Gertrude recorded all monasteries, churches, outbuildings, houses, forts and settlements all around the Karadag. Um, of course, houses and forts were not her main focus, it was the churches and the monasteries and that. Um, but she recorded them, nonetheless. One thing I will say, if you feel like reading A Thousand and One Churches, the term monastic structure is used very, very, like, everything's tarred with the same brush, pretty much. Because small finds were neglected so much, there's not really much analysis into what the buildings were, it's just kind of a generalisation of, oh, this is on a mountain, so it's probably monastic. I mean, a lot of them were monastic structures, but not necessarily every single one of them was actually a monastic structure. Hark! What was actually recorded within this book? Let me tell you. Madden Sahir was the main settlement that they recorded at the foot of the Karadag Mountains, which was littered with churches, as well as a little bit further up at a site called Deal. There was either an elite settlement or a monastic settlement, but that is debated as to which one it is. Gertrude also took note of a lot of smaller churches just scattered across the neighbouring peaks. On the summit, is a modern day Turkish communication centre, which was built over a Byzantine monastic complex, which in turn was built over a pre-classical Hittite cult centre. Don't we just love stratigraphy? And looking at these sites, some of the main things that Bell would focus on to record in her recordings were, of course, architectural styles, masonry, design, carvings, 
and flora and fauna as well because she thought that that could sometimes influence the design and the nature of the buildings. Now I want to talk to you more about Mahalich in detail because this is a very very interesting site. Mahalich is the site where the mice and the important shards are found and it's also the site that's underneath the modern day communications building. Mahalich is a very very large Byzantine ecclesiastical complex. Obviously Bell drew the plans and took the photos of it before the comms tower was built on top so we have a pretty good record of it. I can't find photos for the life of me, I wish I could somewhere, but her drawings of the site line up near perfectly with modern day Google Maps imagery and if that is not precision I do not know what is. Either the modern developers didn't know that the Byzantine complex was there or they didn't care. Either way, we are so lucky that Bell got there first and drew it all. As with most Byzantine churches, it was a cruciform formation with a dome in the centre, with at least four different identified building phases, at least. Uh, this included the addition of a narthex, an exonarthex, and roofed passages connecting all of the outer buildings to the main church, because obviously on top of a mountain, you're going to have some pretty bad weather, aren't you? So it was just a good way for them to get to and from without having to go out in the wind and the cold and the rain and whatever else. I think it was Ramsey who suggested that there was possibly a connection between the name Mahalech and Archangel Michael. Archangel Michael came to be associated with a lot of mountain peaks and stuff. At that time, of course, Christianity was coming into the swing of things, but there's no actual evidence to say this site was specifically named after Archangel Michael. It's just kind of a suggestion because that was kind of a common common running theme. Archangel Michael really, really loved mountains. Can you tell I don't know a thing about Christianity? <laughs> but despite the modern developers just building over parts of the site, it's actually quite obvious that the Byzantine developers took the pre-classical Hittite remains into account when they built their church on top of it. And that segues nicely into the Karadag inscription. Being an inscription, this was of course key interest to Ramsey. It's a hieroglyphic inscription uh, of two Hittite kings. I don't know if I'm going to pronounce these right, I apologise. King Hartapu and his dad, King Murzili III. And the inscription was actually covered up. Basically, the Byzantines incorporated a lot of the previous structure remains, incorporated it into their new building. This includes bits of walls, passages, stairs, uh, entryways and stuff. And this hieroglyph inscription was on a wall. So they had this pre-existing passage of the Hittites. When the Byzantines came along, they installed an extra set of walls on the inside, so the passage was made a bit narrower, so they covered over all the hieroglyphs and all the art of the Hittites because this was considered the worship of heathens, because of course it wasn't Christian iconography that was on the walls. You can't have that in a church, can you? A few Hittite steps and bits of wall can still be seen today, but the majority of it was incorporated into the new Byzantine structure because I don't think there was much left to begin with anyway and then they just kind of built around what was left. And what about stuff on the other Byzantine peaks? Churches on high peaks tend to be quite iconic of Byzantine Anatolia and Bell discovered churches on three other nearby summits. Again, sorry if I don't say these correctly, Hasandag, Kershonju and Hayat, which are all nearby in the same area. Evidence from these peaks allowed Gertrude and William to create a sort of chronology for the site of Bin Berkelis, which they structured around the Arab invasions of the 7th to 8th centuries. But due to a lack of datable evidence, small finds Gertrude Hen, this was more based on fixed assumptions rather than solid datable proof. Gertrude also tried to group church. Jesus Christ, my ring came flying off. Bell also tried to group the churches by certain design elements on both a local and regional scale. But um, due to just variety and architectural freedom, it's a pretty, pretty difficult job she gave herself there. And what about Gertrude today? What do the people think of her in this day and age? She's actually pretty controversial, believe it or not. On the one hand, people think she's great. A Thousand and One Churches is still central to the study of Byzantine Anatolia and the study of Byzantine ecclesiastical remains. And her archive is still used time and time again to aid modern study and scholarship. There were actually plans in the works to make her home in County Durham, a big, big, huge house, into a museum or some sort of monument to her. But obviously with COVID, eh, I don't really know if they went through with that plan or not, or if they just gave up, I don't know. But for now, there's a plaque on the wall. On the other hand, she's often held accountable, along with her colleagues at the time, for bad decision making when deciding the Iraq territories when she installed the monarch phase out first. Her and her colleagues kind of favoured the British colonial interests rather than the interests of Iraq. And inadvertently, those decisions have caused the ongoing conflicts in Iraq and the surrounding area 
Um, of course, Gertrude probably wasn't aware of that at all. And it's kind of a backhander as well to her because such conflicts that have been created in the modern day have caused so much damage to the archaeology that she sought to protect. So there's the two sides of the Gertrude Bell coin for you. But despite this modern controversy, it can't be denied that her archive and her legacy has had such a significant impact on our archaeological record and our understanding of that archaeological record. So final thoughts about Gertrude and her Byzantine legacy. A Thousand One Churches really does set a high standard for archaeological building recording and remains the most thorough study of the Bimbercalese region to this day. No Karadag investigation has been carried out to the same scale since Ramsay and Bell did it. Her work gives us an insight into her influences, whether they be societal or scholarly, 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 scholarly scholarly, not just of her personally, but also of her fellow archaeologists at the time and kind of the general influences and ideas of the field at the time. And her work continues to influence and aid our archaeological work in the modern day, mainly through her archive, which is incredibly important to our archaeological understanding. Um, and without it, we would be about 10 steps backwards. We would lack so much evidence and so much knowledge about the Byzantine ecclesiastical world and even further beyond that. And that about sums up what I wanted to tell you about Gertrude Bell today. Hope you enjoyed that. I do enjoy doing little archaeological themed lessons for you because I mean that is my degree. I've been the last four years studying it, but as well put it to good use. Thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you think about Gertrude. Had you heard of her before this? If you have questions, comments, criticisms, leave them in the comments. I will respond to you as quick as I can. If you'd like to read up on Gertrude or maybe check out the photos in her archive and that, links will be in the description below to all of my bibliography and sources and stuff. In the description box below will also be all of my social medias, including my Twitters, my Instagram my TikTok, my Discord, <laughs> and my sneak elite refer a friend loyalty points thing, scheme, whatever. And don't forget to subscribe if you have made it this far. If you made it all the way to the end of the video, you might as well. Otherwise, what are you doing here? But I actually really enjoyed that. Thank you so much for letting me rant about Gertrude Bell. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next Tuesday. Don't have any plans for next Tuesday, but we'll see how we go.